I'm your host, John Henry Sheridan, and um, today uh, I'm very happy to have my friend, good friend, Osgur Akas, with us, and he's going to tell us about his life and his, uh, his journey. So uh, welcome, Osgur. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining, and uh, thanks for being incredibly patient with me. Uh, nearly a year later after inviting you, we're having this, I think, under a year, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was no uh, timeline anyway, so summer yeah. is a good time to do these things. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. So, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm looking at Facebook to see how, how we're doing, if we're coming through. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it looks like we're here. All right, cool. So, uh, so um, I'm going to just jump into it. Osgur and I have known each other for, I'm going to, 2006, I'm guessing, or 2005, 2006 maybe, right? Six, six or six or seven, six, seven, yeah. Yeah, I guess like by seven we kind of got more familiar with each other. Um, yeah, so what's that, 20, or no, 15? 17 approximately, yeah. Years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, it's been a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. So, you know how it's been a while, although there's still that element of like, Osgur is, is a new friend, but that's not true at all. <laughs> Actually, you're, kind of, you're an old friend at this point, you know? Um, yeah. It's funny. But when depending on when, what period of our lives we meet people, we kind of have this sense of old friend, new friend, but actually after the years add up, you get new old friends, you know? Right, right. You know, I got to um, meet you through my wife, Vivi. So um, there was a point where I felt like I was taking along but I mm -hmm. think I passed that uh, right yeah. long ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, and yeah, well, naturally, you get involved with your right, right. Um, friends. And stuff. Yeah, and I've been having a good time visiting you, your family, you know, and seeing each other grow, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool to have a, another um, friend of a similar age uh, who's mm -hmm. you're, uh, close but distant at the same time, and you kind of get to watch one another and kind of just talk about life together right whenever we meet um so uh let's just dive right into it um i'm i'm not really getting clear uh if anyone's watching on facebook and they were coming through okay just let us know okay yeah it's, it's running fine um so yeah uh please if anyone's watching feel free to uh type something in the chat, a question for Osgur or me, or just say hi, let us know where you're watching from. And i uh, got a couple people watching, so thank you. And if you're watching in the future, thank you for tuning in to the replay. So Osgur, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Anything you'd like to share? Sure. Um, so I am originally from Turkey and um, <clears throat> I have been living in the US for uh, about 18 years so far. And um, I came here at a young age when I was 19 and I made Brooklyn, New York City, my home. Um, so at this um, point, I work as a mechanical engineer. And I've been working as a mechanical engineer for about nine years. Uh, but prior to that, I have um, been working as a plumber. And um, that's, I worked as a plumber for seven, eight years, and that's somewhat how I paid for my college tuition as well. Wow. So that kind of helped me a lot. Um, and so I enjoy traveling a lot, and I go to Turkey once a year. I visit Greece because my wife is from Greece, so I, I visit my in-laws as well as my family. And all my family is in Turkey, basically, my siblings, my mother. So I visit Turkey and sometimes I also visit different countries. Um, but um, I am an avid writer, bike writer. I, I enjoy bike riding. So if you happen to be on 9W on a Sunday, you might see me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so um, and I enjoy exercising. I'm a very active person. I just don't like eating much. Mm -hmm. So I kind of I get in the mood if I'm on the go. That's the, that's the type of person I am. So mm -hmm. 
I think New York City's character really matched with 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 that part of me. That you no, know, there's something like the moment you're out the door, there's something to do, and you 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 know I always found something 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 to do. Always progress myself and my life in some direction, slowly but steadily. Mm-hmm. So um, that's that's a little bit about me. Right now, I live in New, in New Jersey. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the housing prices in, in New York City is above and beyond. And uh, I found a nice, beautiful place in New Jersey I, I call home. And um, <clears throat> so that's what I've been living across GWB, basically. And for the past three years, we moved in just before COVID hit, just mm-hmm. about six months before COVID hit. Right. Um, and that's, that's about me, pretty much. Yeah, that's great. Um, a lot to go from there. But yeah, I agree with the couple of things um, in terms of my own makeup uh, when I get out and move my body. Uh, I'm not an exercise fanatic, but I really prefer to exercise regularly, you know, like uh, I could be down feeling blah in the house. Then I get out and run or ride my bike and uh, I just feel really good, you know. And uh, yeah, just being in New York City, being outside, all the possibilities. I'm pretty local now because having a family and a son and not uh, and not employed for much at the moment, I'm at home a lot, but that's a different joy too. I still, I'm outside all the time, but I'm locally outside. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I definitely uh, relate to the physical activity thing and also mm-hmm. to, to the, you know, the New York is kind of I would for my life style and my personality New York is a good fit too I have to say um, imagine like I don't know how uh, your town in Turkey compares to New York but do you think if you should find yourself magically living with your wife in Turkey right now do you think it would that city that you come from would be a good fit for your personality right now I, I mean, I came from a city of approximately 4 million. So it's mm-hmm. relatively large. It's the third largest city in Turkey, actually. So it's, it's, it has a nice urban fabric. Um, and so, but New York City is a totally different elephant, completely different. Oh. Um, and so if, if I were to go back to that city with my wife, I think, I think, I'll tell you what, if I go back as a retiree, maybe in the future, <laughs> right. because it has beautiful Aegean waters and food is great and people are really, um, they're beautiful, you know, hospitality is, is great. Um, and so I think that would be fine. But in terms of the goals and the vision I have for future, I think where, where I am right now is the right place to be. Mm-hmm. Or, or city, maybe Istanbul would probably do because Istanbul is also, um, really very dynamic city yeah and and the character of the city is about business oriented enterprise oriented Mm -hmm. so it will it might be a place as opposed to the city i came from um and what's the city you came from again what's the name i came from from a city called izmir izmir Mm -hmm. izmir okay i-z-m-i-r yeah so sorry guys we have uh just uh small connection issue hopefully we'll be back and running in a moment i'm just gonna ask osgore to uh, log off and log on again if he has to feel free to log off and back on but i I think he's doing that anyway um so yeah so uh there we go. You're Sorry, back. my internet dropped out. This usually doesn't happen, but <laughs> so we just rolled. Sorry about that. This is uh, this is life in 2022. Um, so, so Izmir, I Z M I R, is that right? That is correct, right? Okay, cool. So that's about four million, which is similar to the size of Brooklyn in terms of population. Uh, yeah, so I guess that that's pretty busy must be pretty urban but as you you said it's not quite it's just not new york right no place is 
Right. Yeah, I, I even spent time in London uh, a few times, twice, two, se mm -hmm. two separate times, and a, a lot of time. And uh, it's maybe the closest thing I've experienced in New York outside of New, uh, New York City, but uh, quite a different vibe. Much more, not, not exactly low energy, but just less exciting, less intense, you know, less bright was my feeling. Also, the weather, I guess, matters. A little bit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in New York, you, you got to drive to BQE, get frustrated, you know, get honked a few times. <laughs> Wakes you up. <laughs> Wakes you up, right. Yeah, there's something about like the that that irritating, impatient, aggressive New York attitude that you do actually miss after a while. You know, if, if you're away from here for a while, like I miss it. Or, But of course, when you come back, it's also you quickly get sick of it <laughs> but uh, right. there's something about it so thank you hannah rot cv who's uh chiming in for joining appreciate it. she hung out for a while she's got to go um so uh all right so i understand you work as a so i said civic engineer but what was it you you said in your mechanical work? mechanical engineer mm -hmm. um can you give us some more details as the type of work you do and what it entails I mean, mechanical engineering is actually um, is a really um, vast amount of industries, covers many industries, you know, from aerospace to, um, you name it, to automobiles, so, or buildings. So my, my specialty is within buildings and building systems. So, um, and there are many different interacting, um, interconnecting systems within a building. So I deal with HVAC systems. So that's heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. So HVAC systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do deal with the environmental control of certain spaces, rooms, buildings, whether, it could, you know, it could be an airport, a terminal, um, it could be um, an office building. Um, so I do look at building codes and things like that and look at some standards, industry standards, and then we come up with um, designs, drawings, and specifications and we select equipment and then we give it to a contractor and contractor looks at that stuff and then they build that HVAC system um, um, and make make the building basically uh, habitable, livable. Wow. So, so the V in HVAC stands for? Um, ventilation. Ventilation. So mm -hmm. heating, ventilation, air conditioning? Yep. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I never knew what the V was. Um, yeah, I have a close family friend uh, who has worked in HVAC for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. For him, he was like putting in a lot of uh, central air, uh, air conditioning units, which had him crawling into tight spaces and kind of kind of hard on your knees and back because he was doing the physical part of it, not so much the logistics of it. Um, yeah, I, I always mind boggling to me that how you could set up a an hvac system for an airport or for a huge mall yeah. or, or building like that it must be super comp complex right i mean they are you know if it's a building you might have a central system that's on the roof you might have an equipment that's actually providing cooling to the building right um or ventilation air to the building right so ventilation by what i mean by ventilation is that actually taking the outdoor air fresh air Mm -hmm. mixing with the indoor air and then giving it back to space you can recirculate the indoor space constantly because it, it leads to um sickness and lack of quality yeah. in the air and things like that so you have to bring outside air but then in, in a day like this let's say it's 100 degrees outside you know the moment you introduce outdoor air into the space you have to condition it you have to pull it heat it um take the moisture out of it and then push it into the space so it's um you know, there's some um, engineering calculations involved with that, and then that's how we do it, we deal with it. But in terms of design, usually HVC equipment, HVC systems are large, and they take, they take, they take up space. So there is usually a back and forth with architects. So that's why those tight spaces happen, because nobody wants to see those systems, but mm -hmm. we still need them. And so we um, install them in tight spaces and small areas and to, to maximize the floor space and the building space that will be leased rented or go for sale wow 
So would you think it would be fair to say that like almost no buildings in New York City have, uh, well, I mean, New York City, uh, it seems like everyone has heating, unless I'm wrong, and that mm -hmm. uh, air conditioning, I would say high percentage of New Yorkers have air conditioning, but oh, I wonder uh, what uh, percentage, if you would guess, of buildings have HVAC systems. I mean, I will say that you, you, you need to separate the buildings, commercial buildings, residential buildings. If it's a residential building, yeah. it's a private home on family or it's a high rise, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, I will say all of the residential homes that similar to yours that you live in probably have window type AC units, most of them. Many mm -hmm. co-ops might also have um, window type AC units, but the moment you go into high rises, they probably have central air system. So how do you do that? So you get something called chiller. Chiller is like a central uh, plant. So it's like a big machine. You put it somewhere on the roof or somewhere on a land where it's available. And then that chiller has the capacity to um, take the fluids that are flowing around and uh, cool it and then and then push it into a uh, what's called a handling units, um, similar to fan that you have inside a room you know, that's blowing air. So that's called fluid going across. And then you have the air passing through, air cools down, and then you get it to the space. So most high rises, I would say, definitely must have, maybe 100% of them, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. If Especially if they are new construction, they must have that type of system where the cooling is centralized and they have in each space, in each apartment, uh, individual um, um, air control systems for airflow. Mm -hmm. And then they are able to provide um, um, cooling or heating to the space, depending on where it is located in the building. So because each space will have different temperature requirements. If you are on the east, so you'll be cooler in the afternoon in the summer. If you are on the west, some will be hidden on that unit. So it will have different temperature requirements. Um, if it's a commercial building, by law, by code, they must all have ventilation. They must all have heating and, and, and air conditioning. So those are also commercial buildings depending on when they are built, um, if they are built pre-war, post-war, I'm not sure, but depending on when they are built, they must all have some kind of um, air conditioning system. So I don't know, mm -hmm. I would guess maybe 90% of commercial buildings, 80% of commercial buildings must mm -hmm. have it. Right, right. Um, so it's, New York City is really well regulated, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to commercial buildings and high rises, high density buildings. So it's, it's really very well regulated. So um, if, you know, if it's something that's been there since the 1900s and nobody's doing anything on it, you know, the city may not go and say, do something with this. But the moment that it's going to be um, modernized or um, some renovation is going to take place in that space, then everything must comply. Maybe not everything, but especially HVAC systems must comply with the uh, codes building mm -hmm. codes, building systems. So, and, and all the building systems must be installed in order to actually give permit to live, you know, permit to occupy to that building. So um, everything is interlinked, everything's caught and for enforced. And the moment you touch something, you need to comply with all these laws and policies and regulations wow. and standards. Kind of sounds cool, but it sounds like a huge headache, right? Could be. Costly, it costs. And costly too. Yeah. Mm, right. So, so let's say there's a building built in 1900 and they're going to do renovations and they, they got caught in the trap saying, okay, now you got to put HVAC or you, or you can't do this. Um, is that going to be most likely very complicated to put an HVAC system in an old building that wasn't designed to have it? It's, it will really, you know, engineering is a multidisciplinary um, field. So, and we often interact with one another. So you can't, Unless something already existed there, and then you just doing taking it out and replacing it in kind. Like for example, you have a window type AC unit, like let's say in your home, you just go into Home Depot, get a new one, and put it on the window. Right? Nobody cares. So if it's a small size unit um, um, that's only cooling, like let's say a uh, two three story building, you just replacing that unit in kind again. Again, depending on what the cause will say, that depends. But most likely that you just have to replace in kind. The unit might need to be more energy efficient, for example. But other than that, I don't think um, there will be much requirement. But 
if there is nothing and then you are bringing this new system is equipment and you have to consult with the electrical engineer right away so you don't know if the building has uh, enough electrical um, capacity or wiring or voltage requirements um, amps and all that stuff the the first thing to check is with the electrical engineer and then you will check with the structural engineer because there was nothing on the roof before or parts of the building now we are putting something on this building is an additional weight so the structural engineer needs to come and take a look at this give an okay to it um so and there needs to be some fire alarm evaluation so you will go to the fire alarm engineer and say hey tell me what i need to do or you, you will look up the code depending on how complicated the new system is if it's a simple system um just a small size unit that's no big deal but if it's a more sophisticated system then you need to look into the fire alarm smoke detectors and things like that so um it's interlinked you know it's not like a one standard on discipline everybody is is needs to work together so usually there is an architect who is leading the project and then the architect designed the space, um, you know, processes drawings and they develop the scope of work. And as part of the scope of work, all the engineers come together and figure out how everything is done um, um, safely, efficiently, complying with all the codes and things like that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Very rich. And so you, you might sometimes get involved with that type of stuff or you're always working in commercial uh uh, not are you, do you work with residential stuff too or always commercial no not residential i do deal with public spaces like airports mm -hmm. and tunnels mm -hmm. and um, office spaces so commercial buildings mm -hmm. but i don't i don't get involved with residential like high rises new construction or converting an old building into a uh, upgraded to a new commercial building no i don't get involved with that but um in, in any case the, the building codes are similar so it depends on what you do. You just turn a different chapter mm. for that type of building. So, but the codes are, um, they're coming from the same books. They're coming from the same agencies, same public administrations or jurisdictions. So, I mean, and you know, they, they, they are different ones for different states. California has a different one. So they are more strict on certain things, whereas New York is more strict on something. But there is a, there's, you know, they all, they can get a code, what's called an international uh, building code and modify it slightly but at the end of the day it will come from the same place no matter what type of building you are dealing with and um, especially if the building is in urban spaces like let's say san francisco or new york city it's most likely the requirements will be similar not okay. drastically different sure wow um all right so let's get back into you your life a little bit more but nobody caught me on these things though I always talk <laughs> to an engineer or an architect so. right yeah i know i know that's uh yeah don't worry i don't think game's gonna hold you Good. to it um but so i guess so you're a mechanical engineer right not civic i don't right. know what's is there such thing as a civic engineer or that no there's up? civil engineer civil okay yeah um civic engineer yeah i made it up <laughs> um civil engineer and mechanical engineer two different fields kind of yeah exactly very different yeah okay so uh, can you tell us about the culture you were born into and mm -hmm. how it influences your life now as you live in a different country? You don't live in the same country you were born into. So tell us a little <clears> about <throat> your culture and, and how you kind of carry it forward. I, I got to tell you right off the bat that, you know, I, I came to New York when I was, I came to the United States when I was 19 years old. So, and I was still ready to really learn a lot and really, um, receive a lot and form my opinions my um way of life in different ways so mm -hmm. i always say yes i was born in turkey but i matured in in, in the us in new york mm -hmm. so <clears throat> because i received a lot from the american culture and from the culture in new york city um but um you know it's i gotta tell you to be balanced and to really feel who i am i needs to acknowledge my soil and that soil is um the motherland is actually turkey so that's where, where, where my grandmother lived my, my siblings live so my mother lives and i learned a lot from there you know the first few years of my life my teenage years so um from songs to movies to um to the expectations in the society you know all that stuff um mm -hmm. So, 
in some ways um turkish culture and american culture are similar mm -hmm. in terms of um the 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 the, the thinking of a family because it's about um you know when we when, when we look at a family in turkey at least from my perspective and ever you know other turkish people might have different opinions on this but it comes down to family values what are those you know um um those values being educated uh, being enterprise driven uh contrib contributing to society learning religion okay um and 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 protecting family so those things i learned in, in turkey right and um so in the us that's uh, that's also very similar you know it's not that drastically different being enterprise driven you know um uh, practicing whatever your religion is or if you don't have a religion you can still practice whatever whatever one thinks that they it comforts them and can they connect with it um so those things were similar but um one thing that is really distinct with the US and Turkey is all the Turkish people are very open minded and you know they there is there is always this um closeness to other cultures and welcoming other cultures i will definitely say that i will stand by that but in america that um that is like coded into the dna of of american culture especially in new york city where i think we have more than 250 different ethnicities or cultures mm -hmm. live in New York City. So that's a living example of that state, ideal state where it's, it's, a, it's a cosmo, not only cosmopolitan, but also it, like does it doesn't matter where you come from and who you are. Like your life before almost doesn't matter. Right. Mm -hmm. Unless unless you think that it does, you know, mm -hmm. and and then you connect with your life, your previous life in, in, in a way that balances you out um, and the way you live, but in New York, it doesn't matter. What matters is that actually how we are able to progress and contribute, make something out of your mm -hmm. time here in this place. Um, so I felt that from the first moment, I, the moment when I landed, um, in the airport, I felt like I had to do something. I had to just keep going here in New York. There was no, no, no moment to, um, uh, rest, but I also felt at home. I didn't feel like I had to, there was a culture shock. I got to tell you for a couple of months. And I didn't know how loud the fire department trucks were. And one time I was working in front of a fire department and I had to work 12 hours. I was exhausted. But I didn't know how fast they needed to come out of the firehouse. So I was taking my time. I was sleeping a little bit. And then these, they, they honk call me and I just got frightened because I, I didn't know I wasn't familiar with that much noise. <laughs> so I never forget that. So, you know, there were these different things that I didn't really understand before. And I was experiencing just as I was introduced to new york city but that embracing culture i think is really unique to united states and it's a living example of how diverse a place can be and it doesn't matter <clears throat> um, where you come from and it, it matters how you are able to integrate mm -hmm. yeah yeah that, that's that's great perspective that, that's something i could guess at right but i don't <clears throat> i sense but i can't say it because i didn't do the integration process myself, you know, but, uh, I, I, mm. I've reintegrated after leaving the country for a while and coming back. And I felt like, oh man, like you said, cosmopolitan, that's doesn't really, that's not a, a big enough a word, right? It's just like, okay, we're just all mixed together and this is how it is here and just kind of be in the present moment and flow with it. Mm. And it's kind of like people mind their own business. I think, tell me if that's true. Do you find that here in New York, it's people mind their own business more than maybe uh, from where you come from? I feel because of its bigness and you're, you, like someone once said, you in New York, you expect your neighbors to be different from you, right? In, in a smaller town or in other countries, you, you expect your neighbors to be like you. <laughs> kind of, you know, depending where it's, you come from. I it's... Guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that, that is correct. So in a, in a way, well, if, if you live in big cities, again, you, you, you could choose to live however you want to live. But in a small, in small towns, small villages, I think people want to know that you are like one of them. So they feel right. comfortable. 
But I think you, you really um, alluded to a very important point there in terms of people minding their own business, right? So um, this is something you'll find less as you go east, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> in, in, in Turkey, so people might mind your business as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, it's not like they're telling you how to leave, what to do, but it's like um, sometimes the community is really strong and that has positive sides too. It's not necessarily um, um, negative in a way that they're telling you what to do, how to do. That's not the case, not necessarily. But uh, I'm talking about in the context of urban spaces, urban places, not necessarily very small villages, right? And it, it, in, in that instance, so there is a close, the neat society like i'll tell you my mother lives in this third largest city in turkey and if she needs something she people will come like she doesn't need to ask mm -hmm. like i'll give you one example that um <clears throat> when my stepfather passed away back in 2017 and you know she was mourning right and i was i, I went from us i took a flight i went back to to make it for the funeral and i could see that these people were pouring in Mm -hmm. I had no idea who they were because I don't really live that live there and I don't have connections. But like not just for the day, for one day, two days, three days, but they keep coming back and they, they keep coming back with pots of food, or they keep coming and then knocking on door and having a seat. Like they, they take a seat for half an hour, sometimes an hour, and there's talking going on. There's exchange about the person. It, it's, it's it's within the context, right? It's they visiting for a purpose, mm -hmm. but there is this very nice slow steady conversation that they imply with every word and the tone that they have that they share the pain mm -hmm. now i don't have my family here i can only speak for myself maybe there is you know there are people who have larger family here they are very close and you meet with them um they are you know maybe the, but i don't see that this is something that that happens in New York City. So people really mind their own business to the point that they don't want to really connect with someone else. They don't want to reach out. <clears throat> um, so that's really a very distinct differentiation in my opinion. In my building, I live in a condo and there are 80, 83, 84 apartments here. So I assume there are maybe 250, 300 people living in here, right? Mm -hmm. So I try to make the um, extra step to converse just to reach out and just introduce myself and have a little tiny bit like 30 second conversation with people. But it's so easy to let go and then just say, I want my own business. You mind your business. Mm -hmm. Don't even say hi to me. So it's very, it becomes very easy. So in Turkey, that might be a little bit um, received as like, oh, this person is very reserved. You know, they don't want to connect. Right, right. So you might feel that pressure a little bit to connect with people. Sometimes you don't want to, but you still have to <laughs> sort of like respect and exchange conversation. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that because, you know, I, I lived in a small village in Brazil for a while and I did experience um, a death of one of the families I was looking after, this elderly gentleman who was pretty, you know, he was advanced in years, maybe 90, I don't know, but he passed away and, uh, I attended the funeral and or whatever it, it's called down there. It's a bit different and yeah, just lots of people, the whole village is coming in to say, I guess some people don't go, but it seems like everyone and everyone spends a little bit of time here. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose I've had a lot of family members die here in Brooklyn or in the US and um, the family comes together, friends, uh, it, but like you said, it's definitely easier to not participate. You know, you could say, even if it's your close family, you could very easily not participate, kind of assuming that you, the family doesn't want you, to, you involved. That's kind of like the thinking here. It's like, oh, they don't want to be bothered. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to overstay my welcome or I'm not going to bother them. Mm -hmm. But in, whereas in Brazil or maybe japan was similar to in the brazil community it you don't even think that you just go and uh it's just this more of a 
communal thing that you all absorb together. Where here, it's easier to feel alone in, in, uh, in general, right? I guess that's a city thing. I guess so. But I think, this, this, you know, same is also true for happy moments, like let's say wedding times, right? So um, I haven't done an extensive comprehensive wedding planning myself, but what, from what I understand, it's involved here in the US, like it's really involved planning and everything. So, and so it is elsewhere in the world, you know, in Turkey, mm -hmm. people plan this thing, you send out invitations. But I gotta tell you, like, there are also moments that people just rent a bus and they just say, X person is having a wedding. Okay, when? That day. Okay, the bus is gonna leave from that point. So people just fill in. You, you know the person, you don't know the person, you just, you're just going to celebrate. You, you, you know, if, if you don't know the person, you don't necessarily go, but what it is is that if you, if it's your um, friend from far and then you have some kind of a connection, you still jump on to go and celebrate. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be, um, let's say, um, it could be uh, the whole town and the adjacent towns can really participate in such celebrations. It's not just um, a few select people that's budgeted out for and then invitations sent. It's, it's, it's like the, the town can become a wedding crusher in some way, but you know, yeah, right, right. But but it's become so festive that way, you know. Sometimes mm -hmm. it, the celebration goes for a day or two or even three days because people are continuing to celebrate. Right. So. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I feel this thing with my own family that uh, a wedding or a funeral we come together, and I'm my American family because I have family in Norway, but different and uh and then usually a lot of times we don't actually see each other until the next wedding or funeral uh there's a few family members we make efforts but a lot of them we don't and even if they live in the neighborhood it's amazing you know it's not that yeah. we want it that way or it's just nature has us going in different directions and that's 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 exactly the point though because a wedding is not you know in the i think communal places where you know people go there to see other people that they haven't seen for a while so it becomes an event where it's an opportunity to reconnect in a way mm -hmm. right so um, so like it doesn't matter whose wedding it is right let's let's all you know use this connecting moment to see other people i mean i don't want to say all but <laughs> it's like you know. right. but it, it sounds like it's a little bit more um loose on that end. loose and and just like socially uh sort of broad maybe or socially welcoming then yeah right. our our very kind of like yeah let's budget out for x amount of people and who comes who who's gets invited who doesn't and you like you you lose sleep over it almost you know um yeah yeah good for you that you didn't have to do it too much deep <laughs> <laughs> deep experience with that um, can you describe your relationship with music? I, you know, I experience music. I gotta tell you, I, if you ask me a single song, I probably can name two, but, <laughs> but I gotta tell you how I connect with music. I connect with music from the early times. I grew up in a very, uh, tumultuous family environment, so it wasn't very stable. But you know, by the time when I got to teenager years, I already looked to find music to, I think, to really accompany my mood. Mm -hmm. so it, the lyrics that I was listening to, the music, the tunes, the melody that I was listening to became an extension of my, of my, of my, of my feelings. So one thing that actually you find in Turkey, at least, you know, when um, in, in my, in my, in my, mind back in the day when I was living is melancholy. Music will always have melancholy to it, attached to mm -hmm. it. Um, sure. Think of Nirvana, for example, you know, mm -hmm. so those lyrics that will put you down. So I will always find those music, uh, type of music in, in Turkey. And I will, whenever I felt like I couldn't really write, read or express. So I will just go to a room and just for a couple of hours, listen to those music and just sort to kind of connect with the lyrics um and get into that mood um and then i think on the other side of that whenever i felt really in good mood then i will listen to maybe pop music or something mm -hmm. to lift my mood up so I, I always felt 
the music is there to really in a way to have my extension of my feelings but also validate the mood that i have in that moment mm -hmm. so um but the the music in turkey actually especially in the um folk music you'll find many um you'll find traces that go to old days old times you know um when people used music to lament for the lost one or the ones that never come back mm -hmm. in the old days of battles and things like that you know they will just go for battlefields and sometimes they will show up so their family never will see these people again so you will have the people who will work in the land lament for the loss mm -hmm. and in those 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 those, those types of music still survive today and some of them they are reused um and uh, by musicians and then put on the market but lyrics are really heavy so it's in the dna of turkish music to have some melancholy in it, mm -hmm. attached to it over centuries sure um and also it's in my i think my my character in a way to really um connect with a music that has some um um i guess melancholy to it definitely mm -hmm. so um and but i do uh appreciate music um i do appreciate rock music especially alternative rock definitely uh, but um if i'm exercising if i'm on the bike sometimes i listen to um electronic music you know that type of thing so mm -hmm. depends. it's really like a uh a utility for you right it's like it's like hvac okay right today i need heat tomorrow i need cold <laughs> right whatever it is that you need to to kind of enhance your life that's yes yeah, one of 4.3 you know if you want to actually if you got your tools you gotta to put the right, right radio stations on <laughs> it's in the mood uh mm -hmm. it's it's i want to say it's utility because i i will say it's a form of expression like you know we listen we write we read so they are from we use body language to talk you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel this is how music is. So if I wanted to really tell somebody how I'm feeling in the moment, for example, I wouldn't have to do anything. Just stay still and turn on the music. Probably the person will have an idea about how I'm feeling in the moment. Wow. Okay. And I never, never thought about, I mean, I totally get it, but I just never thought about someone regarding music as an expression of themselves if you didn't recreate it yourself. But I, I totally understand that. I just never heard anyone say that particularly. Yeah. So like you would say, okay, how am I feeling? And you'd, you'd put on a, or whatever, a track that kind of represents your feeling and say, this is how I'm feeling. Yeah. I could see that for sure. Um, you know, when I think about it, um, I think people who know me well probably are more familiar with the songs I love than the songs I've written, you know? So they're probably more familiar with my enthusiasm about my favorite songs than my own creations. Mm -hmm. Because that, in a way that is really like, yeah, it is a, a very, very much an expression of oneself. Yeah, cool. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, so is there any Turkish genres that uh, you'd like to tell us about? Tell uh, myself and our listeners about i um the 1990s pop music i think from turkey from turkey yeah okay. that's um that would be that would be the one this is when music still had some lyrics attached to it so later on things changed a little bit but um that's that would be pop music of 1990s i guess Okay, yeah. I'm just gonna make a note of that. So, Turkish 1990s pop. Cool. Is is there like a traditional Turkish music genre? I'm sure there must be, but any that like a specific style that has a name that you could think of? Yeah, you could you could search for group your room, your room group your G G R U P, mm -hmm. and space Y O R U N. Group your own. Mm -hmm. 
Is that old style or that's uh... um that's that's more contemporary mm -hmm. but they do um they do play folk music mm -hmm. with let's say um some alternative rock involved that type of okay. style mm -hmm. um yeah you could look into mfo these are initials of the group band members of the time mfo um and yeah okay i'm just curious i really i don't know what uh turkish music sounds like uh, I, I imagine i do because i kind of know what Greek music sounds like what Middle Eastern music sounds like, but I really don't actually know what Turkish music sounds like. So. I mean, Turkish music sounds like actually take it from Arabesque style, mm -hmm. Arabesque, so, because mm -hmm. it has Arab population, Turkish Arabs, but also um, Kurdish music from the uh, Kurds living in Turkey, and it has the Anatolian music, folk music, um, and it has the Western music. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's and it has northern music as well from the black sea area so mm -hmm. they all have they have a totally completely different instruments they have a different um i guess, I guess like within and melody everything is completely different very different music from one another so um you really need to sort of kind of put in the keywords to find out what type of music you want and it's you know, from what part of region what part of turkey mm -hmm. all right um, cool good to know uh fun to explore i actually found um occasionally people will send me things you know just because i'm a musician and someone sent me uh like very heavy metal from india like this really aggressive oh. metal from india and then that i checked it out it was cool then that led me to uh like this really strange hard rock band from mongolia that uses uh, uh traditional mongolian instruments so it's, it's fun to just keep going and, and then this other like band from switzerland which uses the hurdy-gurdy which is a very unusual instrument if you've never heard of that like melodic death metal with this hurdy-gurdy with like a beautiful woman playing this mysterious medieval mm -hmm. instrument so there's, there's it goes on and on you know so turkey turkey turkish music is something i haven't really explored much right they i mean the the anatolian uh, instrument is actually uh, what's called saz it's like a three-string instrument with long branch i'm not sure how to exactly describe it but Neck. this three yeah exactly it has three strings um and if you go to um towards east it has what's called kanun mm -hmm. persian slash ottoman kind of music but i think it's more persian oriented i'm not 100 sure mm -hmm. but kanun is very common in turkey as well uh they're masters of kanun in turkey um, and it is really inherited in the uh, traditional Turkish music. And they have what's called Ud, U D, spelled as U D. So Ud is also very specific to Turkey. Um, okay. And Anatolian instrument with three strings, what's that called again? Saz, S A Z. S A Z. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm getting a. And then you go to the north. We forgot the north. Hold on. Mm -hmm. You go to the north, it's called Kemenche. Kemenche, K-E-M, K-E-M-E-N, Che, with a dot on the bottom, or you can spell in English as C-H, E, Kemenche. Cool. I'll take a look at some of this stuff and put it in the show notes afterwards if anyone wants to, you know, search it themselves. Sure. So, uh, all right, cool. So, next question. Uh, as you know, I am a strong believer in the power of music, and I just wrote a book, Mind Your Music. And uh, can you share from your experience how music may have positively influenced you in terms of your focus and productivity? So, you were talking about like the very just primal emotional going through growing up as a teenager and just using it to kind of enrich your life but what about like focusing and productivity it's slightly different do you have music for that i i used to do uh listen to music in the library uh you know when i was studying college but um 
And those were long hours of studying, right? Sometimes. Um, and they helped me. And I tend to choose music that's on the, um, not as hard rock or anything like this, or uh, but it's most like calming type of music, mm-hmm. slow paced, calming. Um, I will listen to those. Um, and nowadays, as I work, um, actually, I don't listen to music. It's mm-hmm. rare. I don't listen to music. Um, but um, if if I really want to turn on, put some um, headset and listen to music as I work, because I knew what I was going to do, what I'm doing is actually just, let's say, typing something on an Excel sheet or something. I don't have to do it. I don't have to put so much thought into it or calculate something. Mm-hmm. It's just very... Uh, um, that's a basic task. I, can, I might put some reggae on, so mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> that, it keeps me going. So, mm-hmm. um, but I also use music in a different way. Actually, you know, I breathe every day. I meditate every day in the mornings. Mm-hmm. So I do use um, music that's more uh, like nature inspired. Mm-hmm. It could be the mountains, or it could be uh, waves, right? That, that type of thing. Birds, actually, I found it very comforting that um, when I listen to um, bird sounds and um, wind and wave, things like that, actually, I find it also very comforting. But in terms of music with lyrics or, or music that belongs to a specific genre, uh, not so much as I work, no. When I'm on the bike, I listen to, um, um, I have a YouTube mix, so it's usually electronic music. So mm-hmm. that's what I listen to it as I paddle. Mm-hmm. Um, so cool. that's about it, it. It's interesting, you know, for someone, like you said, you could barely even name two songs, uh, even though you don't pay attention to the details of music, perhaps, you still mm-hmm. use it very uh, regularly and very um, uh, consciously and purposely. Right. Yeah, I appreciate the feedback. <laughs> that's that's good. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, because I, I like, I know you and I have never sat down like I do with some friends and just talk music. We just don't do that. But now that we are talking about music, um, I could see you have a very rich use of it. It's just in a very for me, it, it feels utilitarian. I don't know how else to say it. You, or intuitive maybe. You just do it, whatever comes natural to you. It's like, here, this is a resource. I'm going to figure out a way to to make it enrich my life, you know? Maybe you're right. I didn't look at it that way. But maybe maybe you're right. It's more utility-based. Like, in that moment, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to choose this music to just accompany me. I don't know. Maybe you're right, yeah. Yeah, like, I don't know. Like, uh, a lot of my friends uh, and I would talk about specific bands and specific genres and, and musicians and whatever it's just you know one one of different ways that people enjoy music Mm -hmm. uh and i think of those friends that i would discuss more specific artists with um let's say my friends are into hard rock or heavy metal and pop uh i don't think they would use music as uh as flexibly as you do, you know, because they have opinions and stuff like that, that they kind of might feel somewhat Mm -hmm. attachment, but you kind of just use it like what's going to help this thing that I need to do in the moment and you go from there. (laughs) Right. Um, I don't think too much about it. That's that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. Um, So there's a person here named Yoko who's saying, hi, Oscar. Hi, John. Hi, Yoko. Hello, Yoko. Do I know you? Um, <laughs> she said, I just got curious what would be a topic between you guys about pretty international wives. LOL. We could talk about that. <laughs> you want to start? <laughs> but what's it like to have a, a pretty international wife? Um, so my wife and I... Um, are international but not really international 
So I'll tell you why. <laughs> so she, um, she's from Greece. So, and as you know, and um, we are literally across the sea from each other. So she's from Athens and I'm from Izmir. So in between us is the Aegean Sea. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the closest island to Turkey, to Izmir, is really, um, I believe, five hours away, an island. So you take the boat, you are on the boat for five hours, right across this closest island uh, of Greece. Um, and then you are just in Greece. So Athens is 45 minutes flight. So you take the flight and sometimes actually, um, it, you know, they, they get into the uh, cruising altitude and then they start serving tea and they never make it to the end. <laughs> and over the years that I traveled to see the family in Greece and family in Turkey, I found them to be smart and then just get into the like seats close to the front so I can get a tea and sandwich <laughs> because they don't make it to the end because it's such a short flight. Wow. So uh, the thing, the point is that is actually um, we are from similar cultures. You know, uh, we, we are not that different to us, but I never thought actually um, we are at the same time very different. So, and I'm married to an international wife. Uh, she's not from my culture. She's from a different culture. And, and, and I, I learned a lot. I got to tell you, you know, it's, um, I think if, if someone really wants to marry an international person, a person from different country, different culture, or a culture that has very much similarities, but at the same time has conflicts and, and, and differences of opinions about the events of particular times and moments. So it's not, um, it's, 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 it can get, it's so, I found that to be open-minded, like to just on certain things to prioritize what matters over, you know, it's, it's, it's for me, I can have, I can solve everything. I can solve the things that other people can solve between cultures, whatever those problems are, I cannot bring it to my relationship and try to solve it in my relationship. It's not going to help. Mm-hmm. But what I have thought is like just stay open-minded and just exchange. That exchange of con- con- conversation really te- teaches a lot. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot from my wife. And I'm sure she probably learned a few things from me that she would otherwise learn if she did not know me. And same thing applies to me. But but um, other than that, I... You know, she is more international than I am. I got to tell you that. So she's traveled Europe when she was um, in her early 20s. And she appreciates different cultures, traveling a lot. So I got the enjoy and I got to really understand the value of travel through her. Hmm. And because she really wants to see different countries, explore different places and different cultures. You know, um, and that made me go and explore Latin America. You know, I explored Bolivia, for example, just because mm-hmm. I learned that it really matters. Um, and in that's that type of thing is, is, is I think, um, also, I will say language, like language is very, very, very important. I can't, I, I'm, you know, Greek is very interesting, it's very rich. And um, mm-hmm. maybe is really into linguistics. So when there is a word, she likes to open up to the true meaning of that word, where it comes from. And now sometimes when I use words, even in English, it's my second language, not my native language. And sometimes I stop myself and think, is does that word really say what I really want to say? And that's because my wife, uh, she's from Greece, and sometimes she finds English words and the root is in Greek. So she explains to me the meaning of that word. And so I really got to get that awareness of, okay, I'm using this word in my writing or in my speaking. Do I really, does it really say what I really want to say? So um, th- things like this, little things, you know, if, if I think some of the uh, differences uh, are really let go, there's so much that, 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 you know, we can learn from each other. I really believe in that. Um, and not naively, because I, I am really conscious of the fact that the it doesn't have to be like culturally um, very similar or con- culturally very opposite, but I think it has to be no matter what country or what culture, it just helps to uh, observe first where the person is coming from, how do they think, you know, how do they grow up learning that, right? 
Mm -hmm. What are they trying to demonstrate? What are they trying to convey? It really helps. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes, I, you know, we really, it's really are uh, conversing and discussing about certain things very passionately. You know, we have disagreements. But I think knowing that, you know, what matters at the end is family and the relationship and love that we have, it really uh, enriches in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you're also married to uh, um, Yoko from Japan. So I don't know if you will agree with this or you will add something to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree that um, that language is so so interesting and, and so important. And if I marry just, I want to say just, but if I married an American girl from my neighborhood or something, um, yeah, my language sense would, would be just a, a lot different, right? Just a lot less fine-tuned, I guess, you know? And uh, I would probably... Okay, so this is what happened. When I started to, to see Yoko or to date Yoko, if we didn't really date, but when we started to have a partnership, mm -hmm. I was, you know, still very sarcastic in my humor. I was doing my best to evolve spiritually and everything but i would say sarcastic jokes and uh she didn't understand them she didn't understand that it was a joke she didn't understand what i was talking about <laughs> and she just didn't understand the english so she would be like she would give me a look or she'd say what and and then i would have a chance to stop and think and say was that necessary is that sarcastic <laughs> joke going to help anybody is it yeah. going to help our relationship and then after I got a chance to think about it, I said, no, I can't, I'm, just forget about it. And then we would talk about something else, a lot more neutral or a lot more pure in the moment instead of like something connected to the past or some mm -hmm. sort of joke about culture or whatever. And that was a great saving grace for me because it helped me to clean up my, the way I think. So like, in for me, I really saw language, even though it slowed things down a lot for us, for Yoko and I, because her English was fairly weak in the beginning, and then I had to learn Japanese, and so that was fairly weak, because in Japan, she tended to want to speak Japanese more naturally, and so a lot of slow grinding, you know, annoying moments, but uh, but I'm really glad because it uh, strengthened my language abilities and also made me think carefully about what do I actually want to say? Because if I'm going to have to repeat it, it's got to be worth repeating. Right. And some just like flippant yeah. joke that's kind of half negative or maybe kind of pessimistic. It's not really worth repeating. And it's, it, it's going to drain my energy more the second time I say it. And then I have to explain it. So I just was able to uh, evolve, you know, in, in a positive way because of my international wife in that sense or relationship, you know. That's 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 great you say because, you know, you you. You see, there is a uh, interesting point there. You were able to reflect on what you observe uh, in, in the interaction. So you were, you stopped, took, took a moment, and you reflected on it a little bit and realized something you could probably change to help the situation. Um, so that that's amazing. You know, one thing that I will add, um, like you said, you went you went to Japan, right? You lived in Japan, as far as I recall. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, close to two years. And um, I didn't live in Greece. I lived maybe about two months. I stayed about two months in Greece. That was mm -hmm. it. But, um, you know, if, if it wasn't my wife, I don't think I would really get to know Greece to the point that I know right now. So, you know, we would plan to, to go to places that locals will go, for example, or interact with locals that I don't think I would have met the, the hospitality of Greek people the way I experienced. And... Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying just because I was accompanied by my wife, who's Greek, but I think even on one-on-one, -on -one, like when I would converse, I would feel that people are interested in what I'm saying or how I'm interacting with them. And it's not, it's not something on surface. There's depth that I was able to experience. If I were to go there as a tourist, got a ticket, went to an island as a tourist, tourist in, tourist out, it's not, it's not exactly the same thing. No, There's no, true. exactly. It's, it's a very different context than I'm able to, go there and observe and leave it to exchange things with people but again that that comes with i think 
understanding that we are married to international woman and, and and looking to explore their background where they come from what they value and um and and what they want to show us you know in a way that is actually their home place their culture their traditions they big part of their identity so we go in there with their open-mindedness to see what what they are talking about and where they come from mm-hmm. and, but in a in return i got to have a different perspective yeah i'm not oh, the yeah. same person no no way i'm sure so because of the interactions and because of the places that i have seen them so mm-hmm. yeah i i totally agree and i'll add to that but first i want to say that yoko says thanks osgur open-minded and absorbing what she's trying to say first fully are very key attitudes i agree with you too all right thanks um, for the approval <laughs> <laughs> um yes so yeah i think when you mentioned that, how you felt in Greece, that you knew it, got to know it a lot deeper on a much more, uh, yeah, I guess, deep uh, level, and um, how you felt people's genuine nature because mm-hmm. of the situations you were put in. I think probably on some level, tell me if you agree, I, I feel it for myself, I sense it for you, but I don't know, that I see marrying a Japanese woman or an international woman, it could have been a different country, but it was Japan for me, um, as part of like a bigger life mission. You know, like I wanted my life to be expansive. So I really was never, I don't remember ever being attracted to a, an American girl and wanting to marry an American girl. I never felt that. So like I felt like my uh, I, I needed to be with something foreign just to make my life worth living, kind of, you know, like as an ambassador, almost. I didn't consciously think of it, but, you know, it just makes my life more meaningful to me to be able to be a bridge between, in this case, Japan and America. You know, Japan and America have similar, Turkey and Greece have some rough patches. Japan and America, for a long time, we've been great, but Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and then. America bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima. These are horrible, horrible histories that we have, that we share. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, so this Yoko and I have a chance to actually improve international relations by having this personal bond because all the people that we meet, if she meets all these Americans who get to know Japan, who have a more favorable idea of Japan if they didn't already. And then mm-hmm. uh, her people, many Japanese people get to meet me and have a uh, a more a broad sense of what, a, what an American could be, you know, hopefully mm-hmm. favorable. And, you know, so I, I see that on some level I wanted that for my life. I wanted more of like an international or global, like, purpose in a way. Interesting. I did not look at it that way. Um, but now that you mentioned, in some ways... I, I didn't feel it that way, honestly. I wasn't. Um, you said that you were actually preferring to look f- to 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 be in a relationship or marry somebody. Um, like you already had this idea before you even met your co. And is that it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I had. I just never. I always tended to feel attracted to foreign girls. Definitely more than. Uh, Americans and uh, but I also felt that American girls weren't attracted to me or at least the ones that I I don't know just like you know if you put two magnets together and the if you have a great two opposites or whatever they they just come together but for me it was just like this weak connection it just didn't like come together just like <laughs> I just never found that with uh, I, you know I've dated American yeah. girls and very nice people you know attractive in its own way but uh i don't know i i in high school okay in high school i had um well actually i dated a a jewish girl in high school whose parents were from israel so that was you know she was american but again it was she was a foreign she spoke a different language at home so it felt more interesting to me um but anyway uh in high school i did a report on um, 
Japan uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I thought about how horrible it was. And then randomly, I found this later on. I did a report in high school about Japanese wives. And I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I don't know if I had the opportunity to choose the, the subject, and I chose it. But I wrote a paper on Japanese wives. You know, and I didn't go on afterwards thinking I need to get a Japanese wife, but there were a few times as the years went on when I would interact with Japanese girls, women, and I would feel like, wow, they kind of like, I don't know, there's something interesting here. Like, I just felt kind of like a weirdo and like girls didn't get me, but Japanese girls seemed to just not care that I was a weirdo. They didn't see that, you know. Interesting. It, it was so for me, I don't know, I just felt this attraction to Japan to like I the, the Buddhism I practice Nichiren Buddhism is a Japanese based Buddhism which I started practicing uh, less than a year before I met Yoko so I was already like kind of committing to some connection to Japan before that you know you know interesting you mentioned that it's kind of odd like it's not I don't know how it happened for me it's I have a similar story but not it's not exactly the same so um i don't know universe is playing its own thing in different ways it's hard to tell um, but when i was 16 i read an article on a um newspaper back then the newspapers were still being print printed it wasn't digital just a couple of years before they were becoming digital mm -hmm. so and um so i was reading the newspaper i was sitting in a cafe and i was 16 and I read this article about, from a columnist, and they were writing about the economies of Turkey and Greece, how Greece is able to skyrocket and do really well, and why Turkey is not doing well, so whatever. So they were making a, this guy, person, columnist was making a comparison. And then at the end of the day, you know, as a 16 year old, I'm not really concerned with this thing so much. I just found it interesting to read about some other culture, some other country. Mm -hmm. And and when I finished the article, I stopped and I was thinking about how, uh, like, wow, okay, Greece sounds like an interesting place. And back then there were no YouTubes and there were just TV channels and whatever TV channels showed us, that's what we were seeing. And mm -hmm. they weren't showing us Greece as much. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and usually we will see Greek parliament and something like that because, you know, political issues, but we wouldn't really see culture itself unless one had to look for it. So I was 16, I wasn't really interested, but I imagined, wow, it would be interesting to meet a Greek person. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. I still remember that moment, that table, that beautiful spring day, and I was reading the article. I'm like, wow, I wonder uh, how Greek people talk and interact. I wonder what the culture is. It would be interesting to meet a Greek person. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, 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 I met my wife not in person. I, I first heard her voice, and then I got interested in the voice, and... Then I saw her and I'm like, okay, I'm really interested in the person. Then I got to know she's Greek. So um, I didn't get to know where she was from at first. I got to know it gradually. Um, but it's, it's, the, yeah, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the feelings emerged not as a response to where she's from, but rather her voice and her interaction with me and so on. Then the country came later. It didn't matter as much. Um, but I do have, I wish like to meet a Greek person like this and it happens, but it's kind of, it's kind of odd and weird, but it just happens that way. Mm -hmm. And was, was she kind of like the first Greek person you got to know well? Um, I think, yeah, I, the first Greek person I got to know well, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I interacted before with Greek people, but to this degree to form a relationship, to get to know each other closer. Yeah. hundred percent first. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, of course I'm not saying like, that uh, I had to marry a Japanese girl, definitely not, but I did plant those seeds early on, and I felt that sort of like, I don't, not really American guilt about what happened, but but like, I didn't like the history. So I, I wish that it would be, we could make a more healthy bridge now, put it that way. Um, and uh, yeah, like when I first saw Yoko coming down the mountain, when I met her, this like bright spirit with a camera. She was just a cute Asian girl to me. I, I didn't know she could have been Korean, Japanese, Chinese. It doesn't matter. I was interested and curious about her, you know. So similarly, like you were attracted to the voice. It, 
it just happened to be that she was Japanese, which worked well. Um, you know, there were there were Koreans on my team and stuff, and who were attractive in their way, but uh, it was this Japanese woman that. Uh, and also, interestingly, her last name Miyamoto was the same as the last name of my closest Japanese friend at that time. So, like, I heard her name, and it just kind of rang a bell because uh, Amir, the saxophone player I played with, used mm -hmm. that same last name. So, yeah, yeah, like you said, it's mysterious how life works, how the pieces come together. Right. Uh, so, next question for you. Uh, you good on uh, going a little bit longer? Sure. Okay. Yeah, um, why not? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, how do you think... This is, I think you'll have an interesting perspective on this. How do you think music might have influenced the lives of our human ancestors? Like, as far back as you want to go. Um, I mean, it is... It's an interesting question, you know. it's We definitely know how music helped or changed the lives of people. Um, I don't know, a thousand years back maybe, but you know, when I think of music way back, let's say ancient times, I think of natives. Um, so I, it's a, it's an interesting question, but I do think that it's still you know, to bring people closer. I think that it really has a lot to do with it. It really brought people together, united people. Mm -hmm. I have yet to listen to a music that really meant to separate people or agonize people. <laughs> so it doesn't work that way. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can have, uh, uh, let's say, politically oriented far right or far left type of music, but at the end of the day, it's still meant to organize and gather people around something. And um, so I, I still think that I think even back in those days, it really helped to form communities. It really helped to make tribes, get people closer um, and listen to something in common. You know, it's not whose opinions or whose thought it is or whose wants or desires. It's just there is something that soothes everybody's um, um, pain, sorrow, or joy, something that adds to everybody's feelings in that moment, and everybody's listening to one tune, one lyrics, you know, either around a fire, or looking up at the sky, or marching, or walking, or standing still. So there's always, I think, bringing people together. That's really, if, if urban settings were really to protect people and stay closer, stay protected and then make large cities so that people could defend themselves or people could live more efficiently, share resources. I think music really was the first place of that, like before any of that existed. Music was really there to gather people to, uh, to be in the same space and time, mm -hmm. sharing something in common. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, I um, I would add to that, uh, you know. So, kind of what brings me to that question, and why I like to consider it is, because music is basically right now. I mean, along with everything else in our world, is music is a commodity to be bought and sold, right? Which being a, a, a professional or aspiring professional musician, whatever um, I am. Uh, for so many years, I've faced that all the time. Like, what the hell is music? Why does it have to equate to, you know, to to dollars and currency? Why isn't it, isn't it was, you know, it just doesn't seem right. It's not just something to be bought and sold, but it became that. So it makes me think, what really is it, you know? And like you're saying, it, it was this thing that brought united people who were, you know, had... Un unbalanced energies, whether fear or 
whatever kind of energies that brought them together to realize that there's something bigger, bigger than just their own individual lives. Uh, you know, the drums, the rhythm, it strengthens and it enlivens people. Uh, the call and answer, like if you picture like in the slave slave days, you know, the people in the field would holler, you know, whatever, they they must feel sad and depressed, and but they would sing it out, oh, I'm feeling sad today, and someone else would say, oh, I'm feeling sad today, like echo, this call and response thing, which is very yeah. natural from the human soul to do it. And then we come along and, and a capitalist brain says, uh, yeah, you like that, right? That'll be five cents, please. You know, and it's like, and then that just escalates <laughs> and then people take advantage of it and then you got artists like myself and many others who are trying to make money and every spotify play is point zero 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 one cent or something like that at least it's that right I and mean, it's not totally nothing but still you could say um, from one perspective that's not fair but at the other my other perspective is it's just music you know I don't. I, I don't want to demand anyone pay me to play music because I'm going to play it regardless, right? So it's just this interesting kind of philosophical question about music. Like, what the hell is it? Does it have to be monetized? You know, th some people. I would play a song over the years, and some people would say, "Is that a real song? What makes it real? You know, of course it's real. It exists. You just heard it. <laughs> you know, but like, is it published? You know, is it played on the radio? Does it have a really?" high production recording what makes it real it's just it came out of someone's mouth it's real you know but we have this kind of weird standard i i just think that it's the i think um i mean the system that we live in is capital capital capitalism right so and it's really the tendency of capitalism to really hijack something that's emerging something that's happening or really take control of this um Thing that people want to hear, want to listen, or like it, or has a potential to grow or to be something, but they want to get a hand, you know, put a hands on to it right away, turn it to profits. So it's really hijacking off. Same thing with the trends. I mean, if you look at the, let's say, sustainability, right? If you look at the uh, climate change, you know, the first thing, to, what to invent next or how else to. So there's always a way that. In, no matter what the industry is, no matter what, what the uh, trade is or what people, what work people do, it finds its way to turn it into a monetary settings where profits can emerge, right? And, and so I guess at some point, like for someone like I turn on um, internet and I access music in that moment, whatever I desire, you know, it has, um, it's, it really makes, I think people less specific about what the music is or who wrote it, what exactly it means. I think it just makes it more like, as you mentioned before, utility based, right? Um, it's, the thing with music is that music is art. It's not science. It's not finance. Mm -hmm. And it involves iterations. It involves emotions. Uh, it is not something that can be engineered, something that can be calculated. It just happens. So it's one thing with it is that it's also evolving it's changing the industry is changing constantly yeah that's true um, it's i think it, to me i'm not a musician i wouldn't know that it's like you know but from my uh outside observation i don't think one can really stop where it is going but i feel that one can really um, be still part of it but find its own niche he's on her own niche a way to really convey what the message should be in some ways. Um, you know, it's a disadvantage that actually platforms are really putting a currency on it, 0 0.001 cents to truly like, it means nothing for your work, really. But at the same time, you can still choose the platform you want to belong to, or you can you can choose not to participate in all those platforms. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 really, it really depends. Um, I think it spoils it a little bit. It really spoils it because 
I, I I can't imagine like that Zeppelin or I don't know Pink Floyd trying to write music for Spotify, you know, or for YouTube. It's like just they probably wouldn't even care about that kind of thing. It's um, it's like in the past, you know, um, I think it was more that people there was still industry like in the 60s and 70s right in the 80s there was the music industry but i think it was more about um trying still trying like going with the musician's way it looks like this music has this group this band has a good potential oh let's give them give them a chance you know let's let's get let's get their album across let's let's have it you know there will be support to actually get the musician from point a to point b to go big whereas right now i think competition is really fears and it's not the same thing right now it's not so much um about a, a group of people in a company seeing this band and believing in their music and in their talent now it's more i think that your talent whatever it is um may survive or not survive and you may not have a second chance so it's really it's really very highly competitive now than it has ever been that's how i see it yeah well um you know i i tend to like to remind myself if if not others that um it, it's from the get-go uh music uh has been has been a business really any, any, as far at least the 20th century and uh, early on, people would take like, you know, white people would basically come and take music from black people and, and find a way to monetize it. And they would make more money than the, the black artists that created that. There's a history of that in the early 20th century and early 1900s. And then, uh, you know, people like Elvis got really big on from songs that were written by mm -hmm. uh, either written by uh, black artists or in the style created by black artists and they would just copy like almost exactly the same thing but just change the words and call it their own you know yeah a lot of artists made it big like that and so that was totally but you know but elvis's story is very sad you know so he was totally treated like a uh, an object not like a human and he lived a very sad life for quite a few years there um being on pills for for everything towards the end and uh yeah so and that was in the 50s you know 60s so i i don't have any illusions which are, i'm not claiming that what you're saying is an illusion but i do often hear this comparison to the old music industry uh, 50s 60s 70s as being better than the current industry in some way and i just don't see it that way because of i've read the biographies of so many of these musicians and a lot of times it's crash and burn and, and just the heart of it is this uh, what's the word this uh, capitalistic uh, take advantage of something pure and and milk it as much as possible that's at the heart of it so now I see actually the situation now is is the best it's ever been most people disagree with me um, most of my people I talk to anyway but uh, because it's the most democratic for lack of a better word anyone can get their music out there so like you said competition is fierce that that's basically true in the sense that uh, you're you're just like one fish in an ocean of millions and billions of fish <laughs> but at least you can get into the ocean before you couldn't get out of the pond you were stuck in the pond and you'd actually have to be like selected from like the gatekeeper to join the big boys so now you can join the big boys but for anyone to find you or pay attention to you, it's all on your effort. And uh, it, it just seems a lot more uh, effort-based now. And, and what's the word? Um, Merit-based now than ever before. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you still got to find a way to live. You, you, it's very hard to actually make a living being a musician unless you're really cut out for that personality type. It's very, very difficult. Like so, uh, the guy from, I, I kind of like the quote, the guy from uh, Imagine Dragons. Have you heard of Imagine Dragons? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he said, 18, yeah. Okay, yeah, he said, um, 
the only reason you, you would be in the indus music industry is if you can't not be in it. So like if your DNA is wired to be a musician, that's the only reason you'd be in it because if you were a sane person, you would not be in it. You only do it, of course, you have to do it. So someone like me, I don't have to do it, so I can't, I don't do it. It's just unnatural to me. So the people who are in it, they have to do it. They're just wired that way, you know, because right. it's very insane industry still today. Anyway, I don't know, just, just kind of vent uh, sharing my uh, perspective. But I'm not going to stop creating music. I'm a lifer. I can't stop. I'm going to keep on creating. I'm going to have this long legacy of music and for whatever it's worth. And as my writing, too. My writing will be the same thing. And whether it's 100 people who hear and read it or a million or 10, it doesn't really matter. It's just, you know, who I am. Exactly. Um, so what is your general philosophy on life? I, I got to say that actually, uh, I am a person, the, you know, it's the unknowns really interest me. I'm interested in finding out what I think is an unknown to me. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, you know, I don't go after any unknown, but sometimes when I conceive an idea, when I want to find out something, whether it could be um, a um, work related, career related, or something that I desire to do, or something that I want to find out about, about, about myself, my own uh, personality and self. So I kind of reflect, but also I, you know, I know if something doesn't leave me um, and I still have that conceived idea, I still want to find out that unknown um, um, about the work idea I have or something else, whatever it is, I really drive myself towards it. I need to find it out. So I need to explore what that is. And it, it that unknown and the, the fact that I'm not able to, um, I'm, I feel distant from that unknown. I drive myself to get to it, to find out about, I can actually call up people. I can uh, reach out to people. I can, I can start reading about this. I can just get my pen and paper and start sketching something, or I can converse around it. Um, or um, just dream more about that, you know, um, or sometimes just take a step back and let it go. If it stays with me, I continue to explore it. Uh, so unknowns really interest me. I think that's, that's something that drives me. Um, so that's pretty something. cool. Well, yeah, I, in my words, I would, I, would def I would express that kind of feeling as a truth seeker. That's how I identify seeking the truth which is slightly different from what you're saying but uh it, it, it's some crossover there so so one of your philosophies is uh kind of an attraction to unknowns that that interest you i guess right and find out find it out so so that that explains to some degree or maybe a large degree your you know, your spirit to leave your home country, go to a, you know, pretty tough new land of opportunity, New York, uh, America, New York City. Um, but then like, so beyond this, like, drive to know what you don't know and what, what interests you, what I'll go to another question, the next question, which kind of leads into it. What aspects of your life philosophy help you to recover from setbacks? Because you must have faced so many walls of whatever it is, if it's rejection or just financial concerns, relationship, any, you know, well, the whole human spectrum. What helps you to recover from setbacks or just from having a bad day or a bad week? Um, I, I think expressing really the bottom line of it, setbacks. Setbacks do happen, bad days do happen. Um, but I believe the more setbacks are shared um the, the 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 easier it gets to deal with it now if it's a loss of course not there's not much to do about that if one needs to go through it and share it with other people and have that compassion but at the same time if it's actually a bad decision that led to a uh, to the undesired 
result, right? Um, I, I thought it would end up here, but it ended up this way. So I, I also share that, you know, I also, because I'm interested in finding out what I did wrong. If I did right, I, I will also share that, or what I did right, but where it went wrong. So I find that actually expressing the setback and sharing that setback um, with, not with anybody, but with close people, close friends, family, uh, partner, um, depending on what it is, co-workers, right? Depending on the context. I find it always interesting to hear back from people um, to to not just look at it from a different angle and place, but also get it out of my chest. Sure. So it doesn't turn into something that that grows in me, but it's more let out and dissipated. And in mm -hmm. fact, as I share it, I get feedback. I might learn something out of what I did wrong because if something doesn't change, if I don't find a way to uh, change the course of things, that setback might repeat, and mm -hmm. and that will be the most annoying thing. You know, why mm -hmm. does it? Do I end up in the same place? I end up in the same place. So when I share it, not only is dissipated. But, you know, because I trust the people I share it with, so I'm able to learn why I have that setback. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I'm open to critic, you know, of course, from trusted people, not anybody, but it's, it's really makes it easy to deal with setbacks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a proverb, I don't know if it's African or if it was Buddhist that I heard, but, you know, probably every culture has it, which is... Uh, sadness shared is halved and joy shared is multiplied there you go yeah so yeah it works nicely um what about uh i mean as much as you want to say on this or not what about your relationship to god or universe like where does that fit in because it sounds like you have this you meditate you have appreciation of something bigger than you uh is that factor in at all or not really it it does it, it's in the way i live my life it does so i believe god is um some someone that one connects with so it's not it's only up to the person to really define who god is or what god is so in my mind i connect to a creator right and i i know for a fact that there is some powerful thing beyond me, beyond my control, beyond what I how I can actually do things. Or I can only do things in a certain way, but I honestly don't know more than in my head, everything every 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 day of the year is gonna go pretty much unless I make a change of career or something, I move out, it's gonna repeat the same thing. But there are always changes in life. There are always, you know, different good news, sometimes bad news. Um, and but I know there's some greater thing that's really shaping my interactions and my, my life. That, that is, that, that, that's I know for sure. And I think um, it makes it very easy to cope with things, knowing that there's a power greater than myself. There is a power that's um, designing certain things for me. And um, I do, yeah, I do definitely accept God and his existence. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, and what, as, uh, sorry, so can you share um, up to three mm -hmm. inspiring books, films, or shows that you would like to recommend to our listeners? Let's say people feeling a little down or something, they want something inspiring. Books, films, or shows, not too many, but maybe a couple of good things. So, I mean, in terms of books, I think um, I would say maybe I would say, let's say, I think that the one of the books that I read recently is, is about coming from a really place of poverty and lack of resources to over the years progress in life and how else to progress into the next thing that we want to we want to have so stacy abrams has a very interesting book leading from outside mm -hmm. so i think that's very inspirational 
And she has learning not because she read another book and conveyed in that book, but because she has lived through experiences and she has found certain things to be very helpful uh, and uplifting and inspiring. So I find that uh, leading from outside by Sis Abrams is very interesting. Um, I also um, find um, it's not very uplifting, but uh, Seven Samurai, I find it very interesting. So mm -hmm. Seven Samurai, I find very interesting characters. But the character that's in that film that I identified most with is the, I forgot his name, but he is the one that that's Joker. Like everybody is very disciplined and very serious. About, and he's very serious about text as well. But he's dealing with, with his own flaws, with his own desires, but where he is. So he's very always hyperactive. Mm -hmm. But at the end, he, he proves to be really um, a good team member and it's, I found that Seven Sem Sem Samurai is very inspirational in terms of um, how uh, the movie is made, how the characters are really playing their roles. Um, and then what else? And in terms of a, uh, you know, I find comedian, I go to internet to find, to watch comedians. I find Patrick O'Neill, who passed away, to be a really interesting um comedian and the way he looked at things um but that's very uplifting some of the jokes are really you know it's really in depth and he, as he says you know jokes needs to make 50 percent of the people laugh and 50 percent of people frightened mm -hmm. <laughs> so depending on what he says it's it's you know you're either like oh wow is that true or wow okay i'm gonna laugh now so it's very interesting patrick o'neill is quite interesting and uh, i think he is on uh, maybe comedy central I guess I'm not sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, leading from outside, a book, right, mm -hmm. uh, by Abrams, and Seventh Samurai film, and Patrick O'Neill, comedian. Yes. All right, cool. Thank you for your recommendations. Um, I'll put those links in the show notes. Um, and for our last question, um, if there's, if you'd like to share, what are your plans for the next uh, upcoming seven months? Oh, well, I am going to travel so mm -hmm. soon. <laughs> so I am going to Turkey, I'm going to Greece. So so that's standard. But the question is, um, I, like, I like to see some other country as well, because I know Turkey, I know Greece, and I'm going to see family. I, I need to see family. It really helps to keep memory. You know, I feel like if years lapse and there's memory gap, you know, it's not the same. The relationship, I feel like, needs to be reinforced every some time so i'm going to see them but i also want to make a stop in between uh maybe a day two days um maybe in europe mm -hmm. um so i haven't decided where exactly i might do that see different place different country um other than that i have uh, um i have uh, plants to take care of i have flowers hmm. in my terrace so they only care so um tomatoes and sunflowers and all that stuff and um that's it's a construction work going on in the house those windows need replacement the market is all over the place you have no idea i never thought the window replacement would be so <laughs> so difficult really? wow. but the prices are all over the place and the lead times and all over the place so i'm dealing with those and uh that's that's pretty much pretty much it really yeah i'm looking forward to my travel Hmm. Yeah, I, I could I could hear that. Um, it's been a while since I've been uh, out of the country. For you too, or, or did, have you been out of the country since COVID started, or would this be the first time? No, no, you've been once out, right? Actually, I have been out at least two times. Twice. I went to yeah Costa Rica once, and I went to oh, right, right, yeah. I went to Greece and Turkey last summer, and. Um, I haven't actually going around during COVID. I wasn't, I we didn't stay. So we, you know, I asked my work. The one thing they actually, I asked, because since we could work remote, could I work remote from anywhere in the world? So, and my work has a policy apparently that I cannot work outside the United States. And the next question I ask, okay, anywhere in the United States? They are like, mm -hmm. yeah, anywhere in the United States. So um early in covid um i went to florida for a couple of months so i stayed there it's still mm -hmm. in the country but 
Um, it was still traveling during COVID, so it was intense. Mm. Many questions and uncertainty, over preparation, yeah, and too many sanitizers. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I've been I've been going around. I didn't care about COVID as much. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> took the chances. That's great. And you had a, a life experience at a very unique time for for the planet, you know. Yeah, and how was uh, living in Florida for a while? How was that? Um, Florida, you know, I was um, in um, the area that's north of Florida, that's uh, close to the Orlando airport. Mm -hmm. It's called Cape Canaveral. So mm -hmm. that's where the NASA base is. That's where they shoot the rockets and satellites into space. Um, SpaceX shuttles also launch mm -hmm. from there, Cape Canaveral. Okay. So it's very distant and there's an Air Force base called Patrick Air Force. So uh, low construction, low rise buildings and um, the distance spaces. So, you know, um, living there is interesting. It's not like city, you know, in the city you can still walk around, take a transportation, but there you need have a car. Mm -hmm. car is the you must have a car um i found good air quality i enjoyed it i i enjoyed the beach and the sea so i will work all day and then just just basically jump in the water to to relax that was really great mm -hmm. i mean the lifestyle is like could i actually have everything i have here but just there in florida in that location right. it doesn't work that way no. but but it was good yeah you see if I were to stay there for a week, it wouldn't give me the same perspective perspective of um, lifestyle as it does right now. So staying a little longer, I worked from there remotely, same time zone as New York City, that wasn't a problem. Um, but now I have an understanding of what it will take to live there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right, Osgo, this has been wonderful. Um, can we uh, take a picture? I'm going to take a screenshot. Can you give me a beautiful smile? Passport uh, photo or like a smile? Or it's a... <laughs> uh, let's see. Yes, yeah, so just give me a big smile. Ready? One, two. Here we go. All right, and one more time. One, two. All right, cool. So Sounds I can good. use that for the thumbnail. I so had fun. Kind of, yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. Same here. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm going to do some editing and i'll have it up on uh youtube it's on facebook now and it'll be up on youtube by the end of tonight or tomorrow morning sounds good thanks for having me this was a great conversation i enjoyed it really yeah thanks Osgur. and uh we'll be in touch and uh once again thanks for sharing your story with us okay sounds good take it easy take talk care. to you bye-bye all right everyone